Good morning and welcome back to our series looking at the Australian uh, flexible pavement design method. And this week we'll talk about design traffic loadings. These are the loads that are on the pavement structure. And of course we need to design the pavement structure to carry uh, these loads that it will experience. So today we'll talk about how we characterize the loads that are applied to the pavement structure. So again, uh, the, my, that's my contact details. And uh, once again, we'll run roughly for uh, just over an hour. Uh, and remember to click on the Q&A button and type in your uh, any questions you have with the slide number, please. Once again, where the methods that I'm talking about today are in the Austroads Guide to Pavement Technology, Part 2, uh, in, in particular, Section 7 of Part 2 covers the design traffic loading calculations. So in the previous weeks, we've, took, we've, you know, we've given, gone through some overview, really in the first week, and I've gone through the characterization of granular materials and, and uh, subgrade. And last week we looked at asphalt and cement. This week we'll look at traffic loading. So the presentation will, I'll first off give you an overview of the calculation method where we calculate uh, the loading applied to the pavement, just an overview. Then I'll run through uh, the design traffic express in equivalent standard axles or ESAs. And that utilizes what's called the fourth power law, as I'll explain, and also the equivalent, uh, the so-called standard axle group loads to take account of uh, different axle group types. So I'll explain that. Then we'll talk about uh, the design traffic uh, expressed in the number of repetitions of each, each axle group type and load. And finally, we'll, I'll finish up with some comments about the use of ESAs, equivalent standard axles, in the mechanistic empirical design method. So firstly, just give you an overview of the design traffic calculation method. So when we design a structure, we first off pick a design period because that influences the number of repetitions, uh, axle load repetitions we'll have in, uh, that the pavement will experience. And so the traffic loading comprises different axle group types and different axle group loads. And they, this is on this slide here is just an example of the variation we have in configurations of heavy vehicles that we need to account for when we characterise the loads on our pavement. And the pavement damage varies with the axle group type. So in vehicles like this B double shown in the photograph here, that includes a single axle at the front, which is the steer axle. Then the next axle is a tandem drive axle. Then there's a triaxle between the two trailers. There, and finally, there's a trailing tandem axle. So you can see there are various axle groups uh, that the, uh, the vehicles have, and the damage due to those axle groups uh, varies. So we need to allow for that in the design method. And of course, for each uh, axle group type, uh, there's a distribution of possible loads. Uh, some are more heavily loaded and some are more lightly loaded. So we need to consider the loads on those axle groups as well. And this is called the traffic load distribution. So our design traffic then is the cumulative traffic loading over the design period, and the design period may be 20 to 40 years, they're commonly used values. And the, it comprises the cumulative number of heavy axle groups and also the proportion of each axle group type, how many tandem axles, how many triaxles, etc. And also the distribution of loads of each axle group type. So this is a 
the, st the stepwise sort of procedure that you would use to calculate uh, the design traffic. You'd first off select the design period, maybe 20, 30 or 40 years. You, you would identify a design lane. In the case where you have a freeway, for example, where there are a number of lanes of traffic in one direction, you might pick one lane as the design lane. There might be the heavily, most heavily traffic lane on that freeway. And for that design lane, you calculate the initial daily heavy vehicles. This is on opening to traffic. How many heavy vehicles uh, will this road experience? Then using the uh, growth rate of traffic over the design period, you can calculate the cumulative traffic loading over the of heavy vehicles over the design period. And from the traffic load distribution, you can calculate how many heavy vehicle axle groups there are in each, uh, for each heavy vehicle. There might be two or three axle groups for each heavy vehicle. And from that, you can calculate the cumulative number of heavy vehicle axle groups or HVAGs, the common, uh, someone sometimes expresses it that way in terms of HVAGs, how, the cumulative number of HVAGs. So having got the cumulative number of heavy vehicle axle groups, then there are two options. You can either calculate the cumulative number of loads of each axle group type and each axle group load. And this is the method we use in the mechanistic empirical design when we look at fatigue of bound layers such as asphalt and cement materials, where we the design traffic is, is expressed in terms of the cumulative number of load repetitions of each axle group type and each load. There's another method that's been used for many years and that uses the concept of ESAs of loading. And, and this, this method is used for the empirical design chart and also in the mechanistic empirical method for calculating the permanent deformation damage. And I'll explain a bit more about that later. But there are two methods uh, that are used to characterise the traffic. One, a simple method based on an index called ESA and the other a more comprehensive uh, assessment looking at the damage due to each axle group at, of each axle group load and each axle group type. The two methods are there uh, for, they correspond to the use of, for different distress types. The ESA approach is used looking at the rutting damage. So in that case, we can use the simple index ESAs Whereas for the fatigue of bound layers, we look at the fundamental approach where we look at the expected number of repetitions of each axle group load of each axle group type. So that gives you the overview. So now we'll go into some of the details. And first off, I'd like to explain some details about this term equivalent standard axles. And as I mentioned, it relies on the fourth power law and also standard axle group loads. And I'll explain that. So the, e uh, the equivalent standard axles or, e or ESAs was developed as an index to, uh, of loading to express the damage caused by all these axle group loads of various axle group types. So ESA isn't a, a physical entity itself, it's an index of loading. Um, it's not a physical entity. Um, so it, it enables you to look at the combined damage of different axle group loads and types. And it expresses that damage in terms of equivalent passes of a standard axle. And shown on the slide here is the definition of the standard axle. So a standard axle is a single axle with uh, two sets of dual tyres and a load of 80 kilonewtons on that axle. That's our definition of a standard axle. So the ESA method is calculating the equivalent number of passes of a standard axle that would cause the same damage, the pavement damage, as the actual traffic of all the axle group loads on all the axle group types. So it's an index of loading 
the equivalent, damage, equivalent number of passes of a standard axle. Therefore, it's called equivalent standard axles. So, as I mentioned, the e, this ESA approach, uh, this simple index, is used to look at the, the rutting damage of pavement structures. And it relies on what's called the fourth power law to convert different axle group loads to uh, a standard axle load of 80 kilonewtons. And I'll just give you some background about where this fourth power law came from. So there was a, what was called the Asho Road Test in Illinois in the USA in, between 1959 and 1962. And in that test, there were a, number, a large number of pavement configurations built. And we had army personnel driving these trucks around over the, these test pavements over a number of years. And um, from that, uh, those Asho Road, this Asho Road test, the fourth power law was first developed, that the damage is related to the fourth power of axle group load. So that's the origins of the, of the fourth power law. And you can see there, I think all our um, PhD candidates should have a nice hat like these fellows have here. So just turning now to more recent information about the uh, fourth power law, we've, we've, there's been accelerated loading experiments in Australia and New Zealand that have looked at the rutting uh, of granular pavements under different axle group loads. And basically, the, what's been concluded from that, uh, from that research uh, is the damages relate to the, the, somewhere between a two and a fourth power of axle group load. So it's largely confirmed the earlier use of the fourth power that's embedded in the ESAs. So just to give you an idea of what was done during that research, we built these test pavements, uh, granular pavements with sprayed seal surfacings. And you can see there, we apply different axle group loads to a single axle. And we looked at, we measured the deformation or the surface deformation uh, all under those different axle group loads. And from that, we were able to deduce a power law about the influence of load on the deformation of the pavements. And this particular, ex uh, this particular experiment we could calculate a, a second power of, of load was explained the, the rutting damage. But overall, uh, there were other experiments that gave values in the range two to four. And there was also, there's also been recent New Zealand research that on a granular pavement also, in, in this case, loads were applied, a six, six ton axle load and a four ton axle load or it was applied to a pavement. And basically they concluded also that the, the low damage exponent for granular pavements in, in terms of rutting was a factor of between one and four. So from that, we've decided to continue to use, uh, to assume that the damage in terms of rutting is related to the fourth power of load. So, so in our calculation of ESAs, we divide the actual load on the axle group by a standard load and take it to the fourth power to calculate the ESAs of damage due to uh, that axle group load. And this is an example here of what the damage would be if uh, if the load on a single axle were, was 160 kilonewtons compared with our standard axle, you can see that it, it produces the equivalent damage to 16 passes of a standard axle. So the fourth power law is, has been widely used for many years in pavement engineering. And this is an exa another example for a car axle and you can see because of the low damage that cars cause we generally don't consider them uh, when we design pavement structures in terms of the thicknesses of, of lanes. Very minor amount of ESAs are produced by car axles. <laughs> 
So the other element of the ESA calculation is how we account for the fact that we've got various axle group types on the pavement. And we know that the damage due to the axle group types uh, varies um, between them. Uh, so if we had 80 kilonewtons on all these four axle group types, they, were, they would cause different amounts of damage. They wouldn't all be the same. So what we have is a, st a set of standard uh, loads. So we know for, you know, on a single axle with single tyres, 53 kilonewtons produces the same damage as a standard axle. Uh, and our standard axle has got dual tyres and 80 kilonewtons, as we've talked about before. Whereas 181 kilonewtons on a triaxle uh, is the load that produces the same damage in terms of rutting as our standard axle. So they're called the standard axle group loads. So here's an example there. 181 kilonewtons on a triaxle causes the same rutting damage as 80 kilonewtons on our single 80 kilonewton standard axle. So these are the standard loads we, we have, and I'll just run through the origins of those standard group loads. In the early uh, 1960s, uh, one of our staff members at ARB, John Scala, who was our pavements guy, expert, did some um, measured Benkerman beam deflections on a sprayed seal granular pavement in the west of Melbourne. And Basically, though he was looking at the deflections measured with the Benkelman beam under a single axle and also a tandem axle. And, uh, so the assumption of the work was that if the, uh, he was looking for the load on the tandem axle, that would cause the same surface deflection, the maximum deflection, um, as the as the is looking for the load on the tandem axle that would cause the same surface deflection as um, the standard axle. The assumption being that if, you, if the deflection was the same, the pavement damage would be the same. So that was the critical assumption of that method. So, and this testing was confined to granular pavement. So it's looking at the damage I want to estimate the damage to granular pavements. So deformation of the granular layers and the subgrade due to different axle group types. So basically from that research, uh, in the 1970s, these standard loads were from that time onwards used in Australia and different standard loads are used in different countries but these are the ones that had been used in Australia for many years. More recently, uh, we did some research, that same program of research that I explained earlier, uh, where we looked at uh, the effect of different axle group groupings. And we, this is our accelerator loading facility uh, down in Dandenong. And you can see here, we're running a triaxle group we also ran tandem axle groups and single axles on granular pavements. And to, to assess whether or not we could confirm or needed to change these standard loads. So that work was done by Michael Moffat uh, of ARB, uh, who did it as part of a PhD at Monash. And so if you'd like um, to see some further details about work, you could look at either this Ostro's report or Michael's thesis. Basically, the research concluded that we should continue to use these standard group loads. There wasn't any need to change uh, in terms of looking at the rutting damage of granular pavements. They were suitable uh, standard loads to use. So therefore, this is our method of calculating the ESA. It uses the fourth power law, and it also uses the standard group loads that I talked about earlier. So you divide the axle group load by the standard load and take it to the fourth power, 
and that is the equivalent number of passes of a standard axle that would cause the same damage of that axle group type with that axle group load. And that approach is uh, commonly used for granular pavements where we use the empirical design chart shown on the right hand side there. And we'll discuss that chart next week. But the units of ESA shown on the horizontal, uh, horizontal axis have been used for 50 years in Australia. So this is an old chart that I'll explain the origins of um, next week. ESAs is also used for in terms in the mechanistic empirical design method to look at permanent deformation. And I'll give you some further details of that later. So please uh, send in your questions with the slide number and we'll address them at the end of the, end of the session. So now I'd like to turn to the alternative method of uh, design traffic calculation, where we look at the expected number of repetitions of each axle group type and each axle group load. So this method is required when you're looking, trying to calculate the damage in terms of fatigue damage to bound materials. In that case, we need to, to know the expected number of repetitions of each load on each axle group type. So it's this fatigue calculations in our mechanistic empirical method. And that slide just reinforces that. It's used uh, in the mechanistic empirical method. So shown here is an example of those sorts of calculations that you'll see in Appendix L of the Austroids Guide, where you can, this is the, uh, for a tandem axle, gives you an example of, of the number of expected repetitions of different axle group loads from 10 to 160 kilonewtons. And so that's part of the calculation to calculate the expected number over the design period. And we do that for each axle group type, for example, a single axle with single tyres, which is like a steer axle, a standard, a single axle with dual tyres and also, tri also triaxle groups. So for each of them, we calculate the expected group loads, number of repetitions of each axle group load within each axle group type. And then the mechanistic design method, but we then calculate the critical strains to, to the use to calculate the fatigue life under each axle group load of each axle group type. And from that, we can, from the strains, we can calculate the allowable uh, group repetitions, how many repetitions are allowed to compare against the expected number. And we use the performance relationships that we've talked about in previous sessions, the fatigue relationships in this case for, for asphalt and cement and materials to calculate the allowable load repetitions from the calculated strains, the tensile strains at the bottom of the bound layer. So by dividing the expected number of load repetitions by the allowable number, the fatigue damage is calculated for each axle group load of each axle group type. And so in this, for this case of a single axle with dual tyres, you sum the damage of all the axle, due to all the axle group loads, uh, and then combine that with other the damage due to the other axle group types and sum the total damage. In this case, it's 0.7, which is less than one, so this pavement uh, configuration would be acceptable. The damage is less than one. If the damage was greater than one, then uh, the fatigue damage would happen before the, the design traffic uh, was um, consumed. So you would then need to select another trial pavement type and calculate the, the, the allowable loading for that and try and find a configuration where the damage was less than one. 
So lastly, what I'll, I'll run through is the use of the EXA index, that simple index, rather than uh, the more complex uh, looking at each axle group load and type, the use of the ESAs in the mechanistic empirical design method. So the first question might be, why don't we use that simple method of ESAs in the mechanistic empirical design method? It's a much simpler system to use. Um, so as part of that research that I mentioned earlier, we examined that issue and basically found that those standard group loads, although they're applicable to the rutting of granular pavements, they're not applicable to the fatigue of asphalt or cement materials. And you can see on this, in this graph here, how the standard group load would actually need to change with the thickness of the asphalt pavement, for example. So we basically concluded that we would actually have to vary that, those standard group loads with the pavement composition, which makes the process quite complicated to do that, to be varying the load, the standard loads as you change the pavement configuration it would mean each time you change the thickness of the pavement, you would have to recalculate the standard loads to recalculate your design traffic. And the other reason why we don't use it is that the, as we've talked about earlier, the ESA is, uses, is based on the fact that the damage is related to the fourth power of load. Now, in terms of cement and materials, for example, we talked about previously in previous weeks or last week it was about the fact that the fatigue damage is related to the 12th power of strain, which uh, assuming strains are linear related to load means that fatigue damage is related to the 12th power of axle group load, not the fourth power as assumed uh, in the ESA calculation. And similarly for asphalt, for asphalt the damage is related to the fifth power of strain and not the fourth power as we use in the ESA calculation. So, so for that reason, when we're looking at the fatigue of calculations, fatigue damage, we can't use the ESA unit uh, and we have to use a more complex method of looking at the damage on, under each axle group load of each axle group type. But we do use ESAs in the mechanistic empirical method uh, for the, uh, the rutting damage calculations, the permanent de deformation damage. And the question is, why do we, why do we do, why do we use ESAs in that case uh, and not the fundamental method? So the, the performance relationships for fatigue uh, are shown here. This is the asphalt one, the cement and materials uh, one are based on uh, laboratory testing, where we apply different loads uh, to test beams in the lab and assess the fatigue life under different loads. And from those different loads, we have different strains applied to the, to the test beams. So we have some, provide some fundamental information here about the damage due to different loads from a laboratory test. So we have some fundamentals there about uh, the effect of load on fatigue damage. In the case of our uh, estimate, our performance relationship used for permanent deformation or rutting, we don't have a, a lab um, test that actually we can use to calculate the effect of different axle group loads. This performance relationship isn't based on, uh, on, on lab tests. The relationship is based on uh, an association between the vertical strain on the top of the subgrade and pavement performance. So it's, there's no lab test there looking at the effect of, of different axle group loads and, and like we have for fatigue of asphalt and cement and materials. So this, uh, this 
performance relationship, which we call the subgrade strain relationship, but is actually the deformation, the surface deformation due to deformation of the granular layers and the subgrade, was developed by relating uh, field performance data as expressed in terms of our empirical design chart shown on the right hand side here, correlating the loading from that uh, chart with the subgrade strains calculated under standard axle. So we took uh, different pavement configurations from our design chart, this figure 8.4, and for each for a range of CBRs and a range of granular thicknesses, calculated the subgrade strains and then correlated the subgrade strains with the design traffic loading for each configuration that we looked at. So this relationship, when we fitted We've essentially fitted uh, a relationship to an empirical design chart, and this relationship shows would imply that the damage is the, in terms of deformation is related to the seventh power of strain, and therefore, if it's a linear elastic response, uh, it would be the seventh power of axle group load. But as you can see, this relationship doesn't provide a direct information uh, about the effect of, 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 on, of axle group load on rutting. Uh, we don't have a basic lab test there where we can control things and just increase the load and look at the deformation damage. And, it re, and, it, and the relationship we've found there, this re, is very dependent on the model that we've used to calculate the responses, these, these vertical strains on the top of the subgrade. And if we'd used a different response to load model, like uh, a finite element method that allows for non-linearity of granular materials and subgrade, we would have ended up with a completely different subgrade strain relationship. So it's very much a part of our design system, the Ostro's design system, and the rules we have for calculating modulus rather than something fundamental about the effect of axle group load on in terms of damage. So there's doubts about the seventh power law. Uh, there's it, it, doubts about whether the damage is related to the seventh power of, of load from this formula, particularly in light of that earlier experiments that I've talked about in Australia and New Zealand recently that have really concluded the power is really second or fourth power of axle group load rather than the seventh power. And that provided the, that's provided really the key, uh, uh, just key to us now using uh, the fourth power law to look at the damage in terms of rutting of granular pavements and not a seventh power in our mechanistic method. So the mechanistic method assumes that the rutting damage is related to the fourth power load, and therefore we continue to express the design traffic in ESAs of loading. And we don't assume that the damage is related to the seventh power, because we think that that seventh power is an artifact of the way we do our modeling in our design system and how we calculate strains, rather than a fundamental relationship between the effect of load on performance. So that just reinforces it. We're, we're really relying on the information we've obtained from these sorts of experiments to reinforce the fact that we, we think that the, it's better represented in terms of a fourth power and, and the use of these standard uh, axle group loads rather than using uh, the fundamental approach of looking at each of the repetitions of each axle group type and load. So we're comfortable in using the fourth power approach and the ESAs in mechanistic method for permanent deformation. So just to reinforce it then, we use the fundamentals, looking at the number of repetitions of each axle group load and type for fatigue uh, in terms of cemented and, and asphalt. But in terms of uh, deformation of the pavement in the mechanistic method, we use an ESA approach. So 
that completes uh, the presentation. I run through giving you an overview first off of the the method of calculating the loads on the pavement over the design period, because these loads need to be considered when we're looking at what's required structurally for the pavement. And there are two basic units that are used, the ESA equivalent standard axle, and I've gone through that relies on the fourth power law and the standard group loads and where they came from. But the more fundamental method is to look at the number of expected number of load repetitions of each axle group load and type. And I've explained also that we still use the ESA approach in the mechanistic method for looking at uh, the rutting of, of, of pavements and the reasons why we do that. So please uh, send in your questions with the slide number. Uh, now I'll hand it back uh, to uh, for some questions. Uh, thank you, Jeff, uh, for the great presentation. I just went through the Q and A uh, chat in uh, Zoom, and uh, we haven't got any questions uh, from the uh, participants yet. Oh, so if they have any questions, uh, they can uh, send us an email. Uh, right. Okay. Yes. That's that's fine. That's. All right, yeah. so will we finish up there? Yes, uh, Jeff. So the presentation slides have already been circulated with the participants. So if they have any questions, uh, they can contact you. Uh, yes. Contact well, thank you very much for your attendance today. And um, next week, we'll run through the uh, empirical design chart, where it came from and how you use it. So thanks again, and I'll see you next week.